before. My usual uh, I'm a board member and trustee of DASU. Thank you. And Councillor Emery. Yeah, a new one for me, which probably could wait till the next meeting, but I might as well get used to saying it. My husband starts a new job on the 3rd of January. Um, he is counter-terrorism security advisor for, for the Welsh counter-terrorism unit. So technically he works underneath North Wales Police, but not paid by North Wales Police. I'll, right. I'll have a quicker way of saying that next time round. <laughs> but he starts January the 3rd. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Green to item three, urgent matters. I'm not aware of any urgent matters now. Okay, announced by the chair, item four. Can I just take this opportunity to thank the commissioner and the officer of the Police and Crime Commission and the Chief Constable of North West Police for holding the familiarisation day on Wednesday, uh, which we found extremely interesting and informative. And I think everybody went there really, really enjoyed the day. So thank you very much for that. Thanks. And also to the officers involved as well, the firearms officers and the um, the drones officers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Item five: the minutes. We're going to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the twenty sixth of September. Can I remind members that the minutes are for approval only, and not for discussion? Is there a proposer? Okay, and a seconder. Thank you. Say about uh, for approval, but in the minutes on page five, uh, it mentions that the PCP considered the candidates responsive to their questions. Should those questions be included within the minutes? Um, so on, should... this page, on this document, yeah, ah, yes, they are okay, oh, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, okay. If everybody's happy, can I ask the members to show the hands if they agree with the minutes, please? Okay, so we agree. okay thank you for that. Uh, item 6A, which is an update on actions from the previous meeting. Uh, Commissioner, uh, or Stephen, do you have any updates on any actions from the previous minutes at all? Uh, no, sir, as far as I'm aware, all the actions have been um, conducted. Any members wish to bring up any actions from the minutes at this stage? Uh, there are three sets of questions to the PCC. With responses to the PCC attached, and I, I think everybody's got them. Yes. Uh, anybody got any questions in relation to them, or are we happy with that? Yes, Councillor. Yes, yeah. I submitted uh, my questions again because the answers were given by the Chief Constable at the time in a general way in his report, and I specifically wanted you know the questions answered so the board could share those and uh, more in a more pertinent way. Um, so I, I'm very grateful for the responses that I've had so far, but with due respect, I mean, they, they, they've led to further questions and Dawn assures me that I've uh, wasted all my particular time now in terms of supplementaries and can't ask any further questions. This was, of course, in relation to uh, accusations or allegations of domestic abuse or sexual harassment against members of the, the force and how these are dealt with. Um, my original question arose out of the Sarah, Sarah Everard case, where the police officer responsible for the murder actually had, had allegations made against him for uh, sexual harassment and so on. Um, so there, there, there were large questions there, really. So I appreciate the answers that I've received, but you know, with due respect for me, they lead to further questions. And uh, I, I can't ask those further questions now because I've exhausted my, uh, my allowance, as it were. I'm just wondering, you know, could we in fact have a report on this, a further report on this from the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner and, uh, you know, the, the way that these are dealt with. For example, that one of the answers it mentions a threshold as to, you know, those particular cases which are dealt with by the force on the internal disciplinary procedures and those which are then passed on uh, for criminal investigation and prosecution, presumably. Um, I'm just wondering what that threshold is, how high the threshold is, because again, I think that's very pertinent. And again, it mentions to you know the the penalties that are imposed on those particular officers who uh, are dealt with internally. And again, I think it's appropriate that we know what those kind of uh, penalties are, really, so we can be assured that these matters are being dealt with properly and uh, and uh, in a manner which I think would meet the public approval. Of course, since the original question I put, as I said, in relation to the Sarah Everard case, there have been further uh, comments and accusations on this very topic, 
um, in relation to the Gwent Force, hasn't there, really? And uh, you know, the, the you know, accusations of systemic misogyny, sexual harassment, and so on in that particular force. Um, so, I, you know, I think that the, the, they're very pertinent questions to be asked and to have adequate answers to. I mean, we need to satisfy ourselves as members of the uh, the panel that these matters are being dealt with properly. I, I don't want names and so on and so forth. It's just the, the, the way that these particular cases are being dealt with and the nature of those complaints and cases which we deal with internally. And again, I'm not sure really how we operate this because I used to be on the old North Wales Peace Authority and there was a disciplinary department within the force at that time dealing with these matters. But there was also a, a subcommittee of the police authority, which I was chair of at one stage, and we used to do dip sampling on occasions and look into the way the cases have been dealt with to satisfy ourselves and the authority that these have been dealt with in an appropriate way to raise concerns that we might have. So I think it, it, there's room here for a further uh, report on this, if we may, uh, if we can ask that, please, uh, so that we can rest assured that these matters are being dealt with appropriately in the North Wales Force, and in fact that we uh, can then give that assurance to the general public of of uh, North Wales as well. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Biffle. It's a very topical matter, to say the least. I mean, yeah. Commissioner? You... Yeah. Uh, Dioch, uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Bithell. Uh, and quite right to be asking those questions. That's the purpose of the panel being here today, in my in, in my opinion. Uh, very pertinent, as you, as you said. I want to give uh, assur assurances in the, in the short term. Uh, we have got it. We have got violence against women and girls as a, as a deep dive for our strategic executive board meeting, which is be coming up. Uh, we also do scrutinise the the uh, PSD board as well through my through chief the chief executive there. And of course, we have regular updates, fortnightly updates from the, the Deputy Chief Constable as well. Uh, but more than happy to pick up the, the questions that you feel as though we haven't had a, a satisfactory answer. And uh, that's not good enough, in, in my opinion, and, and more than happy for, for the report to be produced for, for, for panel members. I'm not, not saying they weren't satisfactory. I think the Chief Executive answered the question yeah. that I asked. And, uh, but it, but those questions. Yeah. Uh, Just the detail, questions. isn't it, now? Yeah. questions. And I think it needs to be looked at a bit more in depth Absolutely. Really, uh, as to how these matters are dealt with. So yeah. that's the reason I raised it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Deal. Chris, what will you do? Uh, send an email through to Dawn with your specific questions on it and review it for now. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Chem. I had my mic on before. Um, I, I've got a question regarding a, a question from uh, P. Bolton to the commissioner. Yeah, um, you know why do these come to the to, to the uh, to this committee? Because obviously he, he he's had an answer. He said he hasn't had an answer. Has he hadn't had the answer that he wants, or is it that he hasn't had one? But the mm -hmm. The commissioner said he's had an answer to his to his letter and told him where to get his information that he wanted from, and he seems to be trying to, um, you know, make the agenda for this panel, and uh, I, I think that you know. Um, well, applicants for the job itself. So I think they should be sent forward to the people who can answer the questions are they asking rather than this panel. Thank you. The members of the public have the rights to ask questions for the protocol. We've got a protocol which um, members of the public are allowed to ask questions of the commissioner. Yes, yes but uh, the, uh, the commissioner has already answered this, this question apparently. So why does it come to the panel? Well, That's the happened? question I'm asking. Because he's then come back to the panel, we've now responded to that and said that we're not answering that question because it basically he's had the answers uh, to the questions which he posed. And from reading the letter which he sent in, the questions were substantially more or less the same. So we declined to give him the answers to that. Okay, okay thank you for that. Uh, feedback from Mend of Champions. Uh, I mean, I don't suppose anybody's got any feedback, really, because we've only just sort of started up. But uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, Councillor Emery, um, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm just sort of warming into the role, I suppose. And um, it, I, I was a bit unsure as to as to what the role was to begin with, because I, I thought we were 
I, we were here to scrutinise the Commissioner, with all due respect, um, and therefore the Commissioner's sort of budget, really. So I thought the finance champion role was focusing on, which is obviously a very small part of the overall police budget, um, but I believe the champion role is more about oversight of the 182 million, So, which is quite difficult for me to do at a level that I would normally do as a councillor, because obviously as a councillor, when we're overseeing the council budget, you spend many, many meetings and scrutiny and budget working groups. So you have a much better understanding of the budget. And obviously I, this is not the role for me to um, to be able to know the budget at such detail. So I'm, I'm kind of finding my feet with it. I'm obviously meeting Kate before the meeting um, on the 30th of January to sort of go through that. But um, I just wanted to sort of warn the panel really that I, I can't, give it the scrutiny that I would do as a local authority uh, councillor because I'd have to spend hours and hours with Kate, go to audit committees, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a bit of a strange uh, role, really, because um, so I don't want to let you all down, but <laughs> I can obviously look at the budget and I can look at what, um, what Kate tells me. But in order to say, well, why are you doing that and not this? That gets operational and that's not really my role. So, so, so I am, as you know, struggling to work out where my responsibilities lie, but I'm sure I'll find a way. Yeah, sorry. thanks Thanks for that. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of some panellists don't even have men but champions, it's as easy as that. So, I mean, I think we're one upon a lot of panels in, in that we do can go to, to the Commission's office uh, and we do get responses in that manner. But uh, I, I mean, in reality, uh, we've got a small budget councillors have got a lot of uh, things on their time and we can only do so much and we just got to keep an eye on it as best as we can on it yeah Kai. can i just uh, give feedback on a day that we were, we had in uh, november on the fatal five um we we had a Wayne was there, weren't you, Wayne, and members of North Wales Police, i.e. Rhodes Policing Unit. We had the fire service, two doctors, two emergency doctors, magistrate, former magistrate, former prosecutor, chief prosecutor. Who else was there? Yeah. And it was um, a mock trial for six formats, who had, some of them who had started to drive and others who were about to drive, uh, based on the fatal five, and it was... Um, a very productive day, I, I I would have thought. It was a useful day too, wasn't it? And there's a female hospital hospital from the school, the second school in question. So we're hoping that we'll be able to do it again. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I think it was <clears throat> it was really, really effective, particularly for the um the students who came to it. And I think it we managed to get the message across to them quite effectively and because it was delivering this, the message in a number of different agencies you know particularly the thing from sort of the doctors and then listening to the roads policing officers who go to the scenes and then the sort of legal bit as well because quite a lot of the students had an interest in the in law and that kind of thing and uh, I think they definitely got an awful lot out of it. It was an inter students ran the day according to a script and then there were mentors from the different professions. So hopefully uh, there is a request from another school. So feedback on that. is item seven which is the presentation on the checkpoint company program um anna baker is going to take this item thank you anna welcome and the floor is yours Thank you. Thanks, Matt. 
Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation um, and a pleasure to be able to share some of the, the good work with you that's been undertaken uh, at Checkpoint Cymru recently. I'm acutely aware that there's um, people in the room who uh, may not have been around when we first went live, so I would uh, take the opportunity to take you down memory lane a little bit, if I may. Um, and for those of you who have heard it before, I'll apologise in advance. So in terms of Checkpoint, it was um, an idea that was um, put together uh, by our previous um, commissioner, uh, Mr. Aravon Jones. Um, he was progressive in his thinking and liked what he saw being delivered over in Durham, who were delivering the original Checkpoint diversion programme. He wanted to replicate it in North Wales, um, and it also uh, fitted in nicely with the LAMI report in terms of addressing the triggers to offending behaviour, and often prevention is better than cure. And luckily, fast forward to now, we have a commissioner who is equally as supportive of the programme, who appreciates the hard work um, and the efforts that, that goes into it, along with police officers. So although originally a custody-based diversion, it soon became apparent that many of the cases that we were trying to tackle were actually going to be coming into uh, voluntary interviews and stop search as well as custody. So in terms of what Checkpoint is, it is a multi-agency initiative uh, where we seek to reduce the number of victims of crime by reducing reoffending. We're tackling the underlying causes of the, of the offending behaviour such as mental health, substance use, financial issues, to name but a few, and it does provide an alternative to the criminal justice system. So on the basis of that, um, we then decided our strap line should be reducing reoffending and improving life chances, and Checkpoint Cymru was born. Uh, how we went about to do this? Well, first of all, we needed to understand um, eligibility. So who was eligible for Checkpoint? So it's individuals who are resident to North Wales. The offence must have taken place in North Wales. They must be 18 or over. And they must admit guilt. Um, we don't accept cases of uh, no comment interview or won't take or accept responsibility for the offence. We need a baseline. We need a starting point when working with somebody. And at least if there's an admission there, you've got a starting point. In terms of eligibility uh, of the offences, we take anything that is suitable for an out-of-court disposal as per the gravity matrix, which is our Bible. Um, but the, the cases that we won't accept is domestic violence or domestic abuse uh, and assault against emergency service workers. However, we do accept some low-level hate crime cases, and I'm pleased to be able to say that we have a very good working relationship with the CPS in Wales um, and a, a unique arrangement whereby when there are low level hate crime, hate crime cases that come through, uh, we can liaise with them to ensure that they are suitable for diversion and deferred prosecution and long may that relationship um, continue. We do require an inspector's approval on it though, so we do make sure that it is very much a belts and braces approach. Once referred into Checkpoint, um, it's voluntary at the point of access, uh, but thereafter it is mandated. Um, and the contract that we stipulate for individuals to abide to, uh, that they are not to reoffend over the period of the contract, that they do take part in a restorative approach, in restorative justice, if the victim requests it. They attend the sessions with all relevant agencies and they engage fully with my team. And if they're unlucky enough to come across me, that they engage with me too. Um, and to complete any voluntary community work that we would deem suitable. As you can imagine, during the pandemic, um, we weren't allowed out of our homes where we let alone anything else. So there was no voluntary work undertaken at that point. When somebody is uh, referred into checkpoint, there is a very intensive assessment that takes place, uh, a holistic approach to look at all um, underlying needs and issues. And they are mental health, physical health, drug use, alcohol use, uh, education, training and employment, accommodation and ACEs, adverse childhood experiences and any trauma that they've experienced that 
underpins the decisions that they are making as adults. So providing that we can fulfill against the contract that an individual does engage with us, the benefits of, benefits of the scheme are really quite simple. It's a reduction in reoffending. It's a reduction in the number of victims, safer communities, and positive contribution to the community by those individuals that we are supporting. But equally and importantly to services out there, it is a reduction in the demand in the longer term as well as the short term on frontline police and partner agencies and stakeholders alike. Which then comes to the, the question of, so what do these navigators have to do? What, what, what are their qualifications in terms of the support that they're offering people? When we originally went out to advert, we were asking people to be educated to HNC level or possess relevant um, evidenced experience. Relevant experience working in either the voluntary sector or the criminal justice system, experience of developing effective partnerships in a multi-agency arena and preparing individual support plans, very, very important. Good literacy, numerical skills and IT skills to include report and statement writing. I think my IT skills have failed me this afternoon, so I probably wouldn't get a job. Um, full driving license and we have a sliding scale of um, minimum Welsh language requirements. So in terms of the Western area, um, all my navigators are fluent Welsh speakers and then it reduces as you go towards the East. But there is a Welsh language facility uh, across the patch. And of course, I am myself a, a fluent Welsh language speaker. So the navigator will undertake um, approximately 70% of the work. Um, but there are some elements that we cannot do, that we are not equipped to do. So, for example, we, we can't offer financial advice um, because we're not regulated to do so. And in those instances, we will refer to citizens advice to um, Department of Work and Pensions for support. Anybody who requires clinical interventions such, such as opiate substitute treatment, um, anything particularly for physical health or um, extreme mental health, then any kind of clinical in intervention of that need we would, we would refer on. And of course, we don't carry uh, houses in our back pockets, so we would be referring on for, for housing. And then, of course, as we were getting started and warming up, we were struck with a pandemic and we needed to adapt. Uh, in terms of adapting, um, we responded by working from home as guided. Assessments were undertaken over the phone, interventions were over the phone. And when periods would allow in lockdown, we had phased return into community settings, into police stations and partner agencies, as and when places were open bearing in mind that we were quite fortunate really working out of, out of North Wales Police um, because North Wales Police doesn't shut, does it? So we had the ability to be able to see people whereas other agencies may not have been so fortunate. But despite the virus, um, we did continue to make changes throughout lockdown, one of which was the drug education programme, which was originally designed to be a classroom based um, course uh, similar to uh, a driver awareness course if you like um, but again uh, it was delivered on a one-to-one -one basis and in order to ensure that we were getting the most out of it uh, we were asking that people undertook a minimum of two sessions over the phone which gave them a period of reflection the DEP itself um, obviously opened our eyes a little bit into the trends and, and what, what was emerging during the lockdown. And of course, whilst everybody was at home isolating, those who unfortunately are addicted to substances were out um, and were uh, more easily identifiable and were referred on, on to ourselves. And of course, we had to undertake one-to-one -one sessions on the phone so that the workload was increased for the team at that point. The interesting aspect um, was that males actually opened up more on the phone, um, almost like the, the, the barrier in between individuals allowed them to open up, whereas females um, much prefer that face-to-face um, -face interaction. And of course, that's useful to know when moving forward, um, when you're um, future-proofing a, a programme. 
So the drug education programme by today, we are back to the classroom. Um, our classes are booked in advance. We look to try and book six to 12 months worth of, of uh, spaces at venues to make sure that we can fill the, fill the seats as much as possible. And of course, we're targeting more people at once rather than doing that, that one to one. So in turn, that means that the workload is, is less for the team in that sense. So by assessing each person's needs and making the relevant referrals, um, it uh, means that we not only uh, work within our own skill set, but we benefit from the expertise of partner agencies. And these are only a, a small number of, of uh, agencies that we work with. Um, but you will see from that slide, Dawn, remind me, okay. <laughs> uh, that we work with Kaleidoscope de Hrenewid, Adveriad, previously Kais, Wallach, Gorwell, Dasu, the North Wales Women's Centre, Betsy Kudwallader, Haval, um, and DWP. And as I say, that's just a, a small snapshot, really. It's, um, it's the navigator's bread and butter to understand what services are local in their communities. And, and as I'm sure we all know in, in the room, um, particularly third sector agencies can come and go quite a lot dependent on funding. So it, it is absolutely key and essential that the navigators um, are on point in knowing what support services are in their localities, as well as the, the mainstream ones. So on, on to the, the, the pressing question, I guess. I've told you all, all the good stuff that we're meant to be doing, but what does the data actually tell us? In terms of offences, you'll see from this, from April 21 to March 22, 90% of the offences referred to us were drugs possession. Um, and they were then followed by public order, criminal damage, drunken disorderly, um, section 47 assaults, um, some child neglect, possession of weapons. There's, there's quite a good mix there, but there is no doubt that the drugs was, was the main one. And in terms of drugs offenses, it is uh, possession that's referred on to us. We have had one or two cultivation, um, but uh, never supply. Uh, and and that's what makes up our drug offences for those individuals that go on to the um, drug education programme. If we look at um, successful completions, and bear with me while I just enlarge my screen so I can see it. Um, of the 406 successful completions into checkpoint in that, in that period, um, you will see from the slide that uh, there was, um, there was, a, Yep, so there was 210 DEP cases that completed successfully and 196. The spread across the patches were relatively even um, around the 30% mark. Um, and whether it comes as any great surprise, I don't know, but in terms of completions by gender, the majority of our referrals tend to be male. Um, and as you will see from that, we had a split of 76% males to 24% females. Then when we look at the recidivism rate, um, of those individuals that completed successfully uh, overall, you will see that 73% of the cases were not linked to any further occurrences, which would leave 27 percent there or thereabouts um, that were linked to other occurrences and when we say linked to occurrences they were either arrested charged or suspects but actually if we're looking at the ones who were simply charged um, that actually equates to three and a half percent so the success rate um, if you incorporate everything is 73 percent um, but actually of everyone that was charged, um, you, could, you could read it as 97%. And in terms of recidivism by gender, 79% um, of them uh, were males and 21% were females. So if we just break down the recidivism by the two elements of the program, so checkpoint um, of the, I believe, 134 um, suspects, um, individuals rather, 68.4% had no links to further uh, 
criminality, so neither arrested, charged or suspected of anything. Um, and 32 were, but of that 32%, only 5.1% were charged with a further offence. <laughs> so I think it's safe to say at this point, although it's a one year snapshot, um, but when I did my own um, very simplistic trawl through the cases from the very beginning, we were looking at similar rates. So um, I think you'd agree that that is a success. The drug education programme of the um, sorry, 210 individuals who were on the drug education programme, 164, again, were not linked to any other occurrences, arrested, charged or, or suspect of any um, criminality. So that would equate to 73.4% success there. And 22% were linked to further um, occurrences. But again, of that percentage, the ones that were actually charged with an offence was 1.9%. So when looking ahead to the next 12 months, what is it we want to do? What is it we want to achieve? Uh, for us, it's still looking at what we missed in 2020. We were struck by a pandemic early on, uh, and I think you've got to rethink your your um, your aims and objectives when something uh, like that occurs. To look at the gaps in support, to do more restorative work, more restorative justice. Again, it's about bringing people together in conferences, which we couldn't do during the pandemic. But I am delighted to say that we did actually host our first conference, face-to-face -face conference, um, in October of this year, and it was a it was a success to keep communicating, communicating what we do and the good work that we do internally with North Wales Police to, to, to keep ensuring that they're, they're familiar with what we do and how to access us. Building on the good foundation to expand the programme with more complex cases. Um, yes, we have 90% we have of, of drugs possession cases, but we would like more cases that um, that stretch our legs effectively in terms of the skill set and the training that we've had. We want to create an alcohol education programme, and I'm pleased to say that that is on track, um, that will mirror the drug education programme. And the drug education programme is actually going to be uh, improved in the sense that since the beginning of, of the programme, there are things that we've learnt along the way. Um, of which uh, you can't put all drug users into one room. Um, so we are splitting the drug education programme to heroin and crack cocaine use, and then every other class of substance in a, in a separate group. And then we can tailor it more to their individual needs um, and to local needs. And from April onwards, uh, we will be retaining females within checkpoints. So speaking of females, we were lucky enough to be involved in the psychology-led uh, model um, that sits under the Women's Justice Blueprint. Um, and the feedback that we had was, was very positive. Um, Checkpoint was never designed to support women post-assessment because they were referred onward to the, the Women's Pathfinder. Um, however, in terms of what we did do, um, it, was, it was positive response in the sense that uh, the team were all uh, trained and skilled appropriately to, to work with the females. Um, we aligned to the gender and trauma-informed policies. The work that we need to do moving forward to give females the same level of support as we do currently the men is to ensure that the needs assessment is spe specific to females making sure that our language is appropriate for females, making sure that the literature that we have is specific for them, and ensuring that we have environments which are comfortable that will make women feel at ease. Of course, as per the Corsten report, women's criminogenic needs differ to those of men, and it is important that that is recognised, and as such, we are delighted that we will be offering a gender-specific support for females moving forward. Um, 
the navigators have a wealth of, of skills and expertise from working with females from domestic abuse um, to, to many other aspects. So we are um, pleased to be moving forward. Moving on to the, to the next slide, um, some examples of some successful um, cases, good news stories, if you like, um, just to give you a flavor of what we do. So there was one chap uh, living over in the East who was um, racking up hundreds and thousands of hours to uh, emergency services. Um, he was bed bound, he was very unwell, both physically and mentally. And the demand on North Wales Police, Welsh Ambulance and Fire was excessive. Um, he was open to a, a variety of agencies, but he was deteriorating fast. Uh, abusive to anyone who was trying to help him, making unfounded allegations and threats to staff. He declined personal care, food and medical treatments, and as such would often lay in soiled bedding for days. He was volatile, aggressive and displayed signs of paranoid delusion. He was essentially vulnerable um, despite the offending. Um, and in light of all that, we took on the case. Um, he was deemed as having capacity uh, but one of the navigators wasn't satisfied that that was the case. And after much um, persuasion and pulling multidisciplinary meetings together with all the agencies involved, we managed to secure him a, an assessment that was looking at his cognitive assessment, so his ability to process information as opposed to, to, to the capacity side of things. And it turned out um, that there were issues there and as a result of being able to um, push forward with this uh, and bring agencies together, the individual was actually uh, removed from the home uh, and placed into treatment uh, and is now doing very well. Uh, there is a um, statement here from the acting inspector of the area who simply wrote... This is an excellent example of how, hard, of how the hard work and dedication of the checkpoint team has assisted partners and frontline officers in addressing demand. The individual's behaviour was extremely complex and unlikely to be addressed through the criminal justice process alone. The intervention of the checkpoint team highlighted the medical needs of the individual, which were prioritised, positively impacting on the individual's well-being. The team were able to positively work with partners to influence appropriate treatment, significantly reducing demand through a coordinated, pragmatic approach. I wish to thank the team wholeheartedly for their intervention, which has positively influenced reoffending and freed up police and partner resources to address localised priorities. So that was one case. Another case we had was a chap who came to us for criminal damage uh, on the surface nothing particularly alarming to the criminal damage. However, having um, gleaned information from the system, there were some concerns around how he presented and his behavior. Um, on visiting the property, it would appear that he was operating uh, a home of multiple occupancy and had families living in different rooms within the property. Within the property. Um, he was self-diagnosing as schizophrenic and was of huge concern to us, so much so that we pushed forward for him to be assessed through the community mental health team. And within a week, he was seen by a psychiatrist and was uh, diagnosed as uh, schizophrenic and was medicated accordingly uh, to his needs. Now, this was a, an individual who could have posed um, a risk and a threat to the individuals, not only in his home, but nearby where he lived. Um, but with the, the swift action and the astuteness of the team, um, he was identified as being a risk to, to many individuals, including himself. And he was very, very grateful for the intervention and the outcome, having been anti-police uh, and anti anything to do with mental health um, support. Uh, a lot of people will tell you that there's nothing wrong with them. Um, but it's how you deal with those individuals and get them into treatment is actually how eventually they acknowledge that there is an issue. The restorative justice case that we had recently um, was a 37-year-old female assaulting a 69-year-old female, and it was a Section 47 assault. Um, 
we undertook the uh, restorative justice. Uh, both females were brought together uh, and they agreed, they both agreed to take part. And at the end of the session, um, it was it was clear that there were uh, underlying issues for both of them, which resulted in 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 tempers fraying. Um, but the pathways that we undertook with the case that we were working with were attitude thinking and behaviour, um, alcohol and relationships. Um, and the the lady at the time was was experiencing crisis. So we were able to fully support her along with the uh, Women's Pathfinder and bring it to a satisfactory conclusion for all. In terms of feedback, I think that it's um, it's important to note the feedback from officers um, because they're the people who will sell it to colleagues and, and uh, get the buy-in, if you like. So one, one officer wrote, recently I've had dealings with a female who had an alcohol addiction. Firstly, police engagement with her was due to her being intoxicated in public places, which was causing a demand for the local police force. But eventually it also led her to commit a crime. The female was eligible for checkpoint and I felt this would be a really good opportunity to support this female in relation to her alcoholism. A referral was made and checkpoint were really quick to react and get in touch with this female, getting her on board and arranging the meetings with her. Initially, the female was proving difficult to get hold of, but she was provided with a mobile phone to facilitate the communication. And once this was in place, she regularly attended her meetings. The female showed vast improvement over the weeks she was saying that she was engaging with checkpoints and even said herself that she really enjoyed the process and was feeling much better. She turned up to every meeting sober and was looking really well. She admitted to having a couple of days drinking during those weeks, but considering she was drinking heavily daily, this was a massive improvement. I can also happily state that she has had no dealings with the police since checkpoint. This is an excellent resource and thank you to all. Um, just to upset you, Don, just jumping back to the Anglesey case, sorry. <laughs> um, just to give you an overview, this was a case, um, somebody who was addicted to heroin who came onto uh, our caseload, uh, had a, a substance misuse support worker but wasn't engaging um, and also had um, respiratory issues. Uh, we weren't getting through to him, so we uh, teamed up with the local PCSO and we went to knock on the door to uh, understand what was going on. Uh, the conversation went well, he agreed to engage, and he did. After he engaged with us, he then also engaged the substance misuse worker because we um, worked collaboratively with them so that they could also be able to deliver a service um, to him as he clearly needed. Um, and he was, as I say, medicated for the heroin, and he was undertaking ongoing issues, uh, ongoing treatment, sorry, for his um, uh, respiratory issues. So we've had many thank yous. Um, sorry, Don. <laughs> we've had many thank yous um, over the period. Um, and as I say, the, these are only uh, a snapshot of the ones that we've had, but you will see from the screen, um, the help and guidance I received from Checkpoint helped me weed out a lot of issues that were causing me problems. We shall stop at the end of the hour. Have given me got leave, got leave with the hands. We did share that more in the time with the staff and better. Not to wait in a time for I wish to thank Fionn for all her help over the last few months. From where I was at the start of our meetings to where I am now is a credit to Fionn for helping me see, helping me uh, uh, see my true potential. Again, thank you. Thank you very much for all your help and support in the past few months. It's very much appreciated and has made a positive difference in my life. I really appreciated the support I have received from Checkpoint. It has given me an opportunity to talk about my depression and mental health. It's highlighted what human compassion looked like. And on that note, thank you very much. Thanks, well, and thanks very much for that comprehensive in input. Really uh, enjoyed that and I was looking forward to that because I had a number of questions which you've actually got out of your way to answer, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm very pleased about, to be honest with you. Uh, but so I'll just throw it open. Has anybody got any questions, please? Yes, uh, uh, Shana. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. 
Obviously, you give a lot of support and change lives of a number of people. With the numbers, I've got an idea if it's a good or poor number. But what I would like to ask is how many more people possibly can be helped by the service that you offer? I'm thinking maybe about, about people who are refusing to take part and how many more you could help if they did respond more positively to the offer of using your service? Yes, that's a good question. As you can imagine, there are people who are referred who maybe aren't appropriate, maybe aren't eligible, and maybe others decide they don't want to take part in the programme. And to be fair, we have said it's open to people from the point that they come to us and then we wouldn't make them stay with us. So in terms of how many more people we can see, I think that depends on the police really, but also that means that we as a programme have to make sure that we advertise well, that we communicate well with officers and that we make sure that people see the good work that's being done and see the numbers so that they understand the value of the programme and also for the officers, for them to understand how easy the process is and so much work there is. If we can take some of that burden away they, so that they can focus on much more serious issues than we deal with, so that's a really good thing, and especially with the man who phoned up numerous times. So as he used the police time, he stopped people that had other needs to get through to the police or to the fire service or to the ambulance service. So there's an other element to it as well. So it's also helping other people if you like, but there's an scope, I think, within what we do to be able to help more people. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to thank uh, the, the speaker for the delivery today. It's been really uh, encouraging and uh, very worthwhile to hear the results of this. I think when this was first mooted, I think several of us thought, is this an easy way out really for people to escape the, the full force of the law, as it were? Not having, uh, obviously, notwithstanding the fact that uh, you know, very often people who do go to court and are sentenced with fines or imprisonment and so on turn out to be no better at the end of the day, and it doesn't really have much effect on them. And uh, so, but you know, we were willing to go along with this and give it a good try. And it's very encouraging to hear the results. You know, they're, they're very, very encouraging. You know, um, uh, the, the percentages of people who uh, succeeded in coming out of this. Uh, in, in a beneficial way. And again, I think at the time we assumed, or some of us assumed perhaps it'd be mainly young people. <laughs> but of course, we refer to the 60 plus gentleman who was a sort of pest of the police force and other emergency services. And obviously, it's not just young people that's involved in this. And again, that's very encouraging too, you know, that uh, it's been used in those particular cases as well. I was just wondering in terms of the figures where uh, UK, you know, where uh, sort of 73%, I think, was the 73.4% in terms of drugs um, possession cases were not um, did not did not offend again, but I think there was 22% I think uh, were, 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 were further charged as it were, but that didn't result in actual charges being made. I think I think there was a comment. I'm just wondering what what happened to those. I think only 1.9% went on to be charged. Is that the failures of the the, the CPS or are there other particular factors involved in that which are not apparent? Yeah, absolutely, and, and it's a good question. Um, I think that, that there's there's obviously many aspects as to why somebody isn't charged with something. Um, it could be that they're innocent, that they've not um, actually participated in any criminality. There are times where um, people can make malicious uh, accusations 
uh, that are unfounded. Um, um, and there are, there are times where the potentially the, the evidence threshold isn't met, but the police officers in the room can probably better comment on that than myself. Hi, Anna. Uh, just a couple of simple questions, I hope. How do you define low level hate crime? That's the first question. And you, you mentioned giving an example of positive contributions. Well, can you give us an example? What do you meant by that? So the low level hate crime, um, when we have the discussions with CPS, uh, what they're looking to see is whether there is a pattern in the offending. Is it something that they've done before? Has it been going on for some time with the individual? Um, is it something that the CPS are likely to want charged? Um, so low level would be uh, perhaps an off the cuff remark um, that uh, the intention wasn't there to be malicious per se. Um, it could be a rant in public with no specific victim behind it, um, a named individual, if you like. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's important that the CPS looks at these because when you speak to um, stakeholders and victims, what they want is for people to be educated, not sent to court and maybe fined. Um, they want people to understand the impact it has on them uh, so that they don't do it again to either them or to somebody else. And a lot of the time, education is the bit that's missing um, uh, and, you know, acceptable behaviour towards our, our fellow um, uh, people in community. Um, so that, that's the low level aspect of it, um, but it would need an inspector's approval. Uh, we don't take anything lightly. We call it low level hate crime. I'm pretty sure the individual at the receiving end doesn't think it's low level. Um, and it's about how we, how we communicate that. We, we must get the victim's perspective on it and their wishes, um, although they don't have the final say as to whether it would come to checkpoint or not. But we are, we are very victim focused and we need to make sure that their wishes are taken into account as much as we possibly can. That's the comment you made there is what I wanted to hear. Then the other one was the example of positive contribution. What did you mean by that? Yeah, a positive contribution in itself is obviously uh, to stop victimising people, to, to, to cease the offending. If, if you're living a pro-social lifestyle, then you are making a positive contribution. If you can um, be one less person in the cycle of crime, then it's a positive contribution. If you can then find work, it's a positive contribution. And if your children are no longer under the radar, on the radar of social services because you're addressing your behavior, then it's a positive contribution. And, and one of the things that we really must look to do is try and break the cycle of multi-generational offending um, that, that, that stem from uh, trauma and the adverse childhood experiences. That's right. So it's breaking the link, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. It only takes one link to break. Thank you, Anne, for that. Um, when I first started looking at this, I've obviously read somewhere in terms of eligibility, it appears that an offender makes a no-reply interview or denies the offence, then providing that CPS charging standards are met, they are still eligible. But in the beginning, now, you said that's not the case. Has that changed or have I got that wrong? From um, I think that may very well have been um, part of the original concept, um, picking up from um, other diversion programmes. But I think in order to, um, to have that foundation and that starting point with an individual, um, you really do need that admission of guilt. Yeah, that was my main concern, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, just one other question, if I may. Um, so the content of the... What is actually... I don't need to run through everything that went in the content of the classroom based drugs education program, but who delivers it and, and what exactly is the content or part of the content? So it's delivered by the navigators themselves, um, and the content seeks to address um, the thinking behind the drug use. So it, it's quite simplistic, and sometimes the simpler things are, are, are the better things, to be honest. So we look at the cycle of change, which is something that's uh, widely recognised and used within uh, cognitive behavioural theory. 
Um, so we look at the cycle of change to understand where a person is at that point entering our service in terms of their drug use. We then need to understand and we unpick and elicit information around um, what their thoughts and feelings are at the time, what triggers the, the drug use, who are they with, where are they, is there an event? So in a group setting, people will start to offload. Well, actually, I started smoking cannabis at the age of because of or every time I go to a barbecue and I have a pint and maybe a few more pints, actually, the friends bring out the cocaine and I have a line of coke. So it's it's about getting people to be comfortable in a controlled environment to be able to, to discuss what leads them to that point. Once we've got that sorted and established, it's then very much focused on harm reduction. So we don't preach to anyone that we must not take drugs, um, but a lot of people are not en entirely aware of the implications and the consequences of what a drugs conviction would entail. So many educational establishments have a zero tolerance towards drugs and they could be throwing their career completely out the window um, by by being involved in, in that lifestyle. So it's about educating and harm reduction, harm reduction being the key thing, because obviously, as we're aware, with one of the highest rates of drug related deaths uh, in the UK, it is important that we try and have that early intervention approach um, so that we can better improve on those statistics. Just a final one, really. You said that most of the offences that you dealt with up to now are drugs related offences, and you're hoping to move over to include a lot more other offences. What would you say would be the, the ideal split? Would it be 50 50 drugs and other offences? or? Personally, I don't think it's about having a split or a or a, a, a number applied to anything. For me, whether it's drugs possession or it's child neglect or child assault or possession of an offensive weapon, if we can get that person into a better place, that's my focus. What the offence is, it's not that it's irrelevant because it's what's brought them to us, but for us, it's about understanding the rationale behind what they're doing. So... Yes, drugs is obviously prevalent, as is poly drug use. Um, but for me, it's more about addressing the needs rather than the offence. Thanks so much. Anybody, any further questions at all? No? OK. I've, I've just got one more, and that's it. Uh, <laughs> promise you. <laughs> just, how many other, fa other forces are doing something similar? There are several forces within the UK who are opting for diversion. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be sat in, in a, a forum at the moment looking at um, upcoming changes uh, legislation to the out-of-court disposal world. Um, and it's actually quite surprising how many forces out there are delivering deferred prosecution um, and diversion schemes. And the appetite is growing significantly um, throughout the UK. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. I saw a lot of questions there, and you've answered them all, to be fair. Uh, and uh, Councillor Biffle and myself, I think, we're probably of similar mind with, with some of the things, and you've answered everything. And I just wish you well in the future. Thank all you very much. Scheme. I think it's uh, well worthwhile. Hello. Thank you very much, indeed. Thank you. Uh, if we move on now, please, to the uh, item 8A, which is a periodic update by the North Wales Police and Crime Commissioner. Bear with me a moment, so just... <laughs> yeah, let the share. That's different. That's I don't know what's happened with the something's gone on with the IT on the, my side, so I do apologise there, uh, Chair. So uh, yeah, so uh, it's my report to to panel for the period from first of September uh, to the first of November of this year. Uh, the report provides the panel with an overview of the decisions which they have made and other scrutiny activities and actions that I've taken over the term of the report. 
Panel members will be aware that my first police and crime plan was published in the autumn of 2021. And my plan sets out my vision for North Wales, namely that North Wales communities are safe, victims and vulnerable people feel supported, crime and reoffending are low, and people have confidence in policing and the criminal justice system. Uh, my vision is underpinned by three police and crime priorities and a number of associated objectives as follows. Uh, delivering safer neighbourhoods, so underneath that is tackling and preventing rural and wildlife crime. Improve the efficiency and effectiveness of police officers and police staff. Uh, improve road safety. Uh, going on to supporting victims and communities, uh, we aim to be tackling and preventing domestic abuse and sexual violence, safeguarding vulnerable people, including children, tackle and prevent cybercrime, establish a victim's panel, and tackle and prevent hate crime. Uh, and finally, the third priority is a fair and effective criminal justice system. Uh, introduce a North Wales female offender strategy, which is now the North Wales, uh, the women's injustice strategy. Uh, increase, increase the use of restorative justice, support and protect children and young people and divert them away from the criminal justice system and address the root causes of offending and support the rehabilitation of people who have offended. Uh, there are a number of ways in which I monitor the forces' performance against the police and crime priorities and the national measures set out by UK government. Uh, the, primary, the primary way in which I hold the Chief Constable to account is at my strategic executive board meetings. I receive a comprehensive re performance report by North Wales Police at these quarterly meetings, and I also conduct a deep dive of one of the priorities as listed above at each SEB meeting. In addition to the SEB performance report, my team and I also receive numerous quarterly performance bulletins, and they again are linked to the, one of the priorities and that provides additional context to the main performance report, as well as weekly performance overview by chief officers. At the most recent SEB meeting on the 26th of October, we conducted a deep dive of serious and organised crime, as well as equality, diversity and inclusion. And there's a, a table there, which I'm sure is that's, in the, that's included in the pack. It should be. The whole report's included in the pack, so just refer to that. Uh, as you can see there, homicides have reduced in the rolling 12 months, showing parity with the 2019 baseline. Firearms discharges saw a, show a change to a reduction against the baseline of 6% and larger reduction against recent periods. Firearms offences in North Wales are largely non-serious weapons. North Wales is far below national averages. So knives. Uh, NHS data for full series has, has become available on the Home Office DCPP portal. It currently shows zero under 25 NHS ad injury admissions in the most recent 12 months, with 10 in the, in the previous 12 months. There have been no admissions since February 2022, with data being up to May 2022. North Wales Police dedicate research analysis resources to identify and flag serious, or, serious organised crime perpetrators, victims and cuckooed addresses. Uh, a SOC Intel team monitor and develop the intelligence relating to serious and organised crime, in particular county lines, criminal exploitation, modern slavery, human trafficking. Daily tasking meetings are held between departments to share information on emerging threats and a monthly county lines intelligence, prof intelligence profile is circulated to all response units and neighbourhood policing teams to ensure that current threats remain visible. The forces tactical tasking and, and coordination groups identify the highest risk across North Wales the method used by these groups allows for appropriate resources to be allocated and for requests to be submitted to the regional organised crime unit when required. You know, and, and I'm just going on there. I'm just conscious of time as well, Chair. Saving me going through it, just to save a bit of time, uh, happy to take any questions that panel members may have. 
but as I said, I could, I could talk all day about it, couldn't I, really? Thank you, Chair. Does anybody have any questions at all for the Commission? Yes, sir. A few of them, uh, uh, first of all, um, the uh, Commissioner just mentioned the page three, the table there on the national um, uh, police crimes and so on, which are um, highlighted there. The, um, and it mentions firearms specifically, it doesn't mention knives, although it, knives are referred to in the next but one paragraph. I was just wondering why you know, knives are not there in the national crime of policing measures table as it were because again you know from all reports this is far more widespread uh, uh, crime of national concern really where you know people particularly are carrying knives sometimes allegedly for their own protection but of course are used yeah. as well i'm just wondering why that is the case um that, that's my first question uh, and i just like to comment really on page four where reference is made there to the uh, the number of cases which have been brought to court now uh, with organised crime gangs, particularly in the drug the drugs uh, business, and again, you know, the actual um, sentences are being issued. So I'd like to sort of congratulate Northland's police, obviously, to you, uh, the commissioner, for the work that they're doing in this. We've seen that these particular criminals are being uh, caught, and they are being brought before the court. And it's also very pleasing to see the court issuing sentences which are appropriate and fitting. You know, because in the past, I think people must be quite frustrated with the police to go through all the work they do in getting these cases to court and seeing some derisory sentences mm. a slap over the, over the wrist <laughs> in many cases for what most, what most people would regard as very serious offences. And, you know, the, the actual sentences are being issued now are rather eye-watering in mm. comparison with those that were uh, happening in the past. And that's very, very welcome again. It seems the criminal justice system is now working more cooperatively and actually having an effect, so that, that's very welcome. Um, later in the report, you mentioned, uh, uh, I'm going uh, on now to uh, another issue you mentioned in one of your previous reports, Commissioner, regarding um, return home uh, in interviews after children have gone missing from home. And I think you mentioned the fact that uh, very often these particular interviews are not occurring in North Wales, and uh, that alarmed me somewhat as a member of Prince of County Council, and I raised it with our chief officer. The investigator came back to me and said, you know, I think it's well over 80% actually are involved in those uh, in those interviews. So so that's working in Flintshire. They can't actually force the young people to undergo the interview, but every encouragement is made to get them to participate in that. So it would seem that, you know, the, the general comment there is, uh, is, is a cover really, but uh, the system I think is probably patchier than Perhaps the figures and the the, the statement um, uh, gives rise to, you know, in that in that particular sense. I think certainly our authority, I think, are doing their very best. And I pursued that on your behalf, and it is important that they do undergo those interviews because we need to know why children are running away from home and so on. Uh, and hopefully, then those particular issues can be resolved satisfactorily. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Dear uh, Councillor Bithell, and, and thank you very much for the, your very positive comments towards uh, North Wales Police, and I'm, and I'm pleased that, and I know uh, that the Chief Constable will pass them on certainly to to the rest of the force. So thank you very much for those comments. So it's always nice to to hear them. Uh, regard the the first question, I think that would be regarding the. Uh, it's like the national data set that's been set out, so we don't have much control over over that. As I understand it, and I'm sure Wayne or, or the, the chief constable could just confirm that, but that's my that's my understanding of it. Uh, just going to the, the last point you made, Councillor Bithell, regarding return home interviews. I know that there are a number of local authorities who perform really well at this. Uh, unfortunately, there's some who, who are quite not hitting that mark, uh, and I know it's something that. Uh, it does concern me, and you know, and, and Councillor Bithell knows me uh, too well, and, and my involvement when I was a kinship carer, and the importance of having return home interviews. Uh, so it's very much on on our radar, and we're and we're looking to be working with each of the local authority leads 
And indeed, there has been quite a number of meetings now, and we have a, there's a dedicated officer from North Wales Police uh, linking in with the the, uh, the relevant people in each each local authority area. So that's what that's being progressed through. But I would like to see a uh, an improvement in that, uh, and and maybe there's learning from each local authorities in supporting each other to overcome that as well. And, and I'm very I'm a big uh, advocate of of that collaborative approach and and seeing what and sharing best practices that that we can all benefit and and in particular it will be the children who are going to benefit from this aren't they in the longer term so uh, I hope that uh, addresses the the questions you had Councillor Bethel. Roger. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the report, Commissioner. Um, I'm looking at the statistics regarding. Um, Domestic abuse, um, quite concerning. Um, it says that they're twenty point two percent higher than pre-COVID, um, eleven and a half percent higher than the previous twelve months as well. Uh, so, a few questions really: How do we in North Wales compare to the national average? I understand that there is an increase across the board, but how do we compare nationally? And looking also at, I know you, we do have a, a few things we put in place now. Um, uh, domestic abuse performance improvement plan but it also does say as well that um there's an increase on uh repeat offenders for victims as well so is the plan working and do we have adequate resources for the sector please uh Dear Councillor Williams, and some really good questions there. And you know, we we always know of how much of a priority violence against women and girls is is to each of us here in the panel. And I know it is with with my office, with the, with the North Coast Police Force. Uh, indeed, we've got uh, both myself and and the Dep Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner, a White Ribbon Ambassadors, as well. So very pertinent to us. Uh, I would say that there's been because there's that awareness now would contribute to that uh and I, and I and i don't think that's a bad place to be about increasing and in, increasing that awareness and what what we can do to support people in coming forward to make sure that they what they're experiencing is being dealt with uh, by the police service uh i'm just going to pass over to wayne because of wayne because that this probably links in quite nicely with the, the women and justice strategy as well and, and some some synergies there so i'll just pass over over to Wayne. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, the data, you can look at it, it is, it is concerning because of the, the levels of domestic abuse. But one thing I think um, significantly for North Wales is the crime recording practices, which have been inspected before by the HMI CFRS, have stood up to the, the uh, highest level of scrutiny. So I think people are confident coming forward to report domestic abuse. And that's good that we service it then because the commission in the commission service we've got to some more domestic abuse victims is there and in place and they're doing an excellent job and there was a launch uh, you would have seen in the press a few months ago where they'd taken on additional staff and and as andy said as well we the violence against women and girls agenda is really important but we must also remember that domestic abuse males can be victims as well and we don't lose sight of that but as the deep dives that we do with the force at strategic executive board we've examined violence against women and girls twice this year already and we will re revisit it again in the new year particularly things that are now becoming more and more um, eminent things like stalking and harassment and making sure that the forces approach towards stalking and harassment which we've seen big increases on and coercive control is appropriate so the whole violence against women and girls agenda it, it does gather pace and we do do a significant amount of scrutiny on that about what the force does and although it is re it is servicing more victims, those victims then get the appropriate support they can get, and where appropriate, you know, offenders can be prosecuted as well. Yeah, thank you. Jim. Just to go back on that, and so are we saying that the increase in domestic abuse? Um, so the national average, are, are we booking the trend of that, or is it are you just saying that our reporting mechanisms? Are better and people feel more comfortable to come forward or are we actually seeing a, a larger than normal increase across the country I don't, I don't actually have the data to hand so i couldn't tell you where we where we sit currently because obviously the data changes but i think the, re the response that the force has got in place particularly through things like the improvement plan um 
does put the force well placed in the scrutiny we're applying to make sure they're doing everything they possibly can to to raise the issue and for the officers have got it at the forefront of the mind of when they're dealing with it and trying to find a solution a long-term solution and not adopting this problem solving approach as well of not just trying to deal with one domestic incident that may occur because we all know from all the available research you know there can be many many instances of domestic abuse in a household before a victim will come forward to report it so the force has also invested a lot of time in problem solving to try and get to the root causes of problems and not looking at individual solution uh, sorry individual instances but looking at a more rounded solution for it but your actual point about where the force sits i don't have that data to hand ready right now so um it wouldn't be right for me to try and answer that one Uh, on Nigel's question, uh, you know, I can speak with my sort of domestic abuse hat on, really. We had about a 40% increase in the number of referrals for domestic abuse post-COVID, and that was expected, you know, because uh, these women had been locked up, as it were, with the perpetrator for months on end and couldn't actually get out to, to actually report it. So that was an anticipated increase, really, in the number of cases. And, of course, that particular sit situation where... They, they've been in that uh, in, incarcerated virtually in the house with the perpetrator um, accelerated the incidents and the number of reporting which we expected um so uh, I think uh, I think we have to bear that in mind too there was a very there was a lull because the cases weren't being reported then after the restrictions were lifted you know the, the, the report came in so you know you're quite right obviously the reporting mechanism is working far more effectively nowadays. Um, so, so, you know, but that's certainly a factor we need to bear in mind in terms of the, the upward trend. Uh, Dio, uh, just really come in on, on that, and may, some of you may have picked up on, on uh, the Domestic Abuse Commissioner visiting Rex somewhere, which myself and the Chief Constable were there to attend a meeting, and the, from, from her, herself, uh, she was commenting on how how uh, good the level of service that we're getting in, in North Wales is, is really, really high. Uh, it's very impressed with what we're doing uh, as a police force, but also the commission services that we provide as well. Uh, and I think that uh, came through with uh, the Off One conference we had as well. The first time uh, we've had a, a conference regarding uh, domestic abuse and modern slavery as well. Uh, and that's landed really well with with the, the partners that we work with, got a really lot lot of uh, good coverage there, uh, and I I also re received a letter from the uh, Abercrombie MS as well, congratulating on the work uh, that you know in particular Matthew, uh, who, the head of head of comms and engagement, uh, in organising the event. Uh, so, despite the concerning data coming through, and uh, but I think the the important thing is that is that we recognise. The service that we are providing and the me mechanisms that are in place are really serving North Wales well. Uh, and when we're getting comments like that, especially from the uh, Domestic Abuse Commissioner, uh, really puts, it, puts us in a, a really strong, really strong place nationally. Thank you. Thanks, Emery. Um, I've got a question which isn't really a lot to do with policing. It's around the Regional Strategic Partnership Review. Um, Perhaps these have, these boards have got different names because I've never heard of some of them. The regional leadership board is that the six leaders and the six chief execs that sit on it. What is the regional leadership board? So yeah, so the six uh, local policy chief execs, leaders, chief constables, PCC, chief executive and chair of the health board, chief fire officer, uh, and some of the other policies on it as well. Okay, so it's the same. Okay, same one I'm thinking of. So now we've got a new North Wales Strategic Partnership Board. What's that? Um, a dis um, staffing. A decision was made at the Regional Leadership Board that business and administration report was required for the new North Wales Strategic Partnership Board. Oh, so, no, so that's so the, the Safe the North Wales Partnership Board that sits in the UK. Um, so then the other two, so you've got the Area Planning Board that is from the Transportation Board that's on second to the Board. Um, so that that, that resource has been referred to as the support forward. Right. Okay. So there's a new. Okay. So it's nothing to do with um, 
I haven't heard of North Wales Social Care and Wellbeing Improvement Collaborative. Is that like the Regional Partnership Board? No. I've never heard of these things. <laughs> Uh, and what about the, the corporate joint committees? Is that uh, nothing? To yeah, do just to, just to try and, and and give more assurances than that. How about we take from from this the, the meeting uh, a, a structure of how, how which organisation, which partners that we work with, and how and how that looks within the organisation yeah, from a re, from that North Wales yeah. regional perspective. And I think that'll be benefit beneficial, especially newer members. As yeah, well. yeah, because like, yeah. some of them I, I would have thought I would have known about in my, in my council head on, but I've never heard of some of these. Yeah, happy to, happy to take that as an action from, yeah, great, from like today. A, like a, yeah, like an organisational chat would be. Yeah, that's fine. Just by email is fine. Great, thank you. I quite find the reference in the report, but I think it was 140 cases of stalking mm -hmm. uh, that the police have been dealing with. Um, I believe new legislation is going to be introduced. I think it's a private member's bill, really, in terms of stalking. Um, to, to what extent is there a feeling amongst the police that you know more uh, strength in, in law is required in dealing with these particular cases as and when they arise? So hopefully that's on. Thank you. Um, so. So I suppose it refers back to the last point about domestic abuse increases. Um, and, you know, I suppose what I'd say is, is we are pretty good in North Wales when somebody does come forward to report a matter to us. We spend a lot of time with that individual going back through what's happened, because we know that the first time somebody will report something to us, actually the incidents have been going on for some years and we record every incident that happens which is why we end up with higher recording levels because we're doing the right thing by the home office counting rules and by the legislation that's set out to make sure that we've got a true picture of that individual's offending behavior so we stand an opportunity of being able to break that cycle of abuse get the perpetrator into the right place in terms of um, you know, getting that behaviour to stop so they don't just move on to another victim and also protecting that victim from further issue. Um, stalking and harassment will make up some of those offences that we see coming out. And I suppose what I would say is with the introduction of any new piece of legislation comes additional reporting. So we're likely to see as, as we get new legislation coming in, increases yet further still um, around the amount that you know, people are reporting and we're recording and also seeking to deal with individuals. So it's always good to have um, the legislation to be able to deal with particularly stalking and harassment behaviour because it's quite complex. Um, we're doing quite a lot of work at the moment as part of the violence in uh, violence against women and girls network across Wales to understand that with some important work, academic work that's been researched about the behaviour of offenders who you know, per perpetuate their crimes around stalking and harassment and, and the, the type of devastation that brings to victims. Um, so we want to understand that before jumping forward in relation to additional legislation, because actually the legislation we've got and the prevention orders that we've got access to, you know, I think are adequate, um, but we need people to come forward to report it to have the confidence to stay with that report and to allow us to be able to bring those offenders to justice with the legislation that we've got sorry that's quite a long-winded way of answering the question but I'm hopeful that it ties in with the previous point around domestic abuse and whether or not we're an outlier as far as I've seen to this point we aren't an outlier in relation to our most similar family but it's something that we're keeping a very close eye on and what I would be wanting to do more than anything is get a true report of the crime that is happening out there um, you know, and challenge others to perhaps make sure that they've got those reporting practices 100% right um, so that we're actually offering the service to the victims that need that opportunity to be able to break free from abuse that they've been suffering with for many years. Uh, before I ask for a proposal and a seconder uh, for the periodic update, um, I'd just like to thank you, Councillor, for those remarks, but also say I'm conscious there's nothing on the agenda where you can actually say anything that you wish to say, but as a fact that you're here, is there anything that you would like to say at this point? Uh, 
No, thank, thank you very much. I, I had the opportunity to come to the police and crime panel in a slightly different guise as I was waiting to see whether or not I was going to be uh, um, approved. <laughs> so it was a slightly more nervous meeting um, for me, um, but it is a real um, great opportunity to be here. So thank you very much. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm, I'm five, six weeks now into my time here at North Wales, really enjoying it. There's some fantastic work going on. And um, hopefully we all have the opportunity to see that by the Commissioner's screen scrutiny of us uh, with a lot going on now on the lead up to Christmas um, very busy time for our officers um, and incredibly impressed with the dedication and professionalism that I'm seeing across the board to delivering for our communities so thank you oh yeah yeah sorry that's just reminded me really I mean did you thank the staff who contributed to the familiarization day that we had last week I can pronounce it properly. For me, yeah, can't spell it. <laughs> I can't spell it either, but there we are. <laughs> we all had a very good yeah. yeah. Poser for the uh, periodic update. Okay, and the seconder. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Now moving on to item 8B which is an update on the 2022-2023 budget, and it's Kate, Kate Jackson, who's taking this item. Kate, floor's yours. Uh, well, yeah, um, it's nice to see you again. Report. Um, the 2021-22 accounts and audit, I'm really pleased that we've once again received an unqualified audit opinion. And I'd like to express my thanks and appreciation to the Forces Finance team. We work over the Okay. Um, I'd like to express my thanks and appreciation to the Forces Finance team who worked hard to prepare the accounts on time and to a high standard as always, um, and also to Audit Wales who completed their work in line with the revised timetable and to our Joint Audit Committee for their oversight. Uh, the Auditor General issued the Notice of Certification of Completion of the Audit on the 29th of November. Um, when we receive the annual audit letter, which we're expecting imminently, this will complete the cycle for 2021-22. Uh, the statement of accounts are published on our website together with an, with an introduction to the accounts and an easy read version also. also. Um, this year's budget update, we're anticipating an unspent this year and much of this can be attributed to Operation Uplift. The budget for the additional officers was built in from the 1st of April 2022 and it's currently anticipated that the up Uplift target will be achieved during March 2023. Because of the expectation that officer numbers will need to be maintained during the CSR period, it's anticipated that the underspend position will not continue into the next financial year. Um, as you might expect, energy and fuel costs are higher than budgeted, which is down to higher prices. Uh, capital work's been undertaken to reprofile the capital budget, and this continues on an ongoing basis. Um, there's a need to balance a number of factors with this. There are operational requirements to maintain, improve and or replace estates, vehicles and IT. And the force will not perform well unless it has the infrastructure in place to support it. But the programme does need to be deliverable. Um, we have had a tendency to profile the budgets optimistically in terms of timescales. Um, and that's good. It's prudent. It ensures we plan to have the resources available as soon as they're required. But it does mean those resources can't be used for anything else um, pending the capital expenditure. Um, we need to prioritise the capital programme to ensure it can be delivered. Um, affordability is an increasing risk in the capital programme. That's down to high inflation generally and also a tight labour market, which means we're competing for builders. Um, I think I'm the fourth person to mention the uh, familiarisation event last week, so I won't go into it again. Um, Joint Audit Committee met on the 8th of December. Meeting papers are available on our website. Um, and I would just mention the open session of Joint Audit Committee meetings are held in public. So anyone who wishes to attend, if they contact the OPCC, and they'll be given the information to do so.
Uh, future planning, uh, the work to prepare the budget for 2023-2024 and the accompanying MTFP uh, is well underway. We're still working on assumptions about overall funding until we receive the provisional settlement. So we aren't in a position to estimate council tax increase at this point. Um, however, based on indications so far and knowing where inflation is if especially high, we anticipate that the increase per the last MTFP would leave a funding gap, um, which we're working hard to close. The, budget, the Commissioner's budget proposal for 2023-2024 will be presented by, to Police and Crime Panel on Monday the 30th of January. Um, there is a survey on our website and paper copies are available in libraries and some other buildings, which includes a question on our funding. Looking even further forward, um, the funding formula review, the Minister of State for C Crime, Policing and Fire has confirmed a renewed commitment to continue uh, a funding formula review um, and has asked the Home Office officials to prepare for a first public consultation to take place in early 2023. Um, are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was just actually something that was flagged up at our famous meeting last week, and that was to do with um, efficiencies and cost efficiency we mentioned. And in, the, in that phraseology, some great cost efficiencies. And then the question, a second question was asked about, well, how have we done that? And, are, and were they subject to any sort of a cut? Was it was are we saving money by not doing things in simple terms? So my question, and maybe not you can't answer it today or now, or but hopefully soon, would be indeed if there are uh, reductions in um, financial reductions, are they linked to any reduction in a service or a provision that we could actually clarify, see, and therefore we could all understand? Big question. Uh, sorry. Yeah, that that is a big question. Um, I did mention last week that we do uh, priority resource planning and part of that is identifying where we have the capacity maybe to do a little bit less in some areas. So we do want to continue to provide the service that we need to provide, but some ways of doing things become less necessary as new methods come along or as new priorities come along. So yes and no, there will be cuts, but that doesn't necessarily affect the service that we wish to deliver to the public. Okay, just to further, I, I get that, I understand that it evolves, and you might have better technology, do it cheaper, but I personally, just as a request actually, I'd still like to understand that evolution so that I can see and chest out your logic to make sure it's appropriate for the public, if that could be done. Yeah, we will bring that as part of the presentation at the end of next month. Perfect, thank you very much indeed. Commissioner. Thank, thank you, Councillor, for the for the question. It's good to have that challenge. I think this is really healthy. Uh, I think what would be useful as well, especially for, for newly elected members of the panel, is that over the last 10 years, there's been at least £35 million worth of savings made. Savings, cuts, whatever it is, you know, there's been around that amount. And I think it's just quite appropriate just to bring it to this arena now before we present to you when, when it comes to the preset, setting the precept that you have a real significant say on that, as well as members of the public. And we are all listening to what's being said there, just to put that back. And I just think it's be useful for you to know. Thank you. Again, I'm really showing my new new member colours today um, in the process of setting the council tap precept. So the meeting's 30 for January, we will find out what you're thinking in the precept what a week before 10 days before whenever it's announced that'll be the first time that we will hear what the percentage figure is is that is that correct 10 days before the 30th of jan something like that so is that right ish that is when we will publish that data yes okay so when when we come to those discussions and again it's working out how much power we have i just I mean, obviously, you probably don't know, but the fire authority have put in quite a large council precept, which has gone down very badly with council leaders and will be rejected this afternoon. So we don't want to be in that in that position so late in the game, do we? Uh, Does that ever happen? Um, not here. It has happened elsewhere. Um, right. And it has happened three times in Wales in my tenure right. and this okay. role. 
Okay, because obviously 10 days before the 30th of Jan doesn't give us a lot of, if you come back and said, hey, well, let's go for 13%. How would that work out if we went, well, that, we don't think that's appropriate? How does it work? Uh, there, there is a process to deal with that, that um, okay. if the panel vetoed it, yes, um, then there is a process to come back um, so, so many days later. So, there is a second meeting built into the diaries already in right, early okay. February. Okay. Yeah. Just to, just to come back and, and, and support in uh, what Kate's saying there, because we had that familiarisation uh, last week I think that was a, there was a, quite a few things in there which would indicate which sort of direction the travel will be going yeah. as as well as the the consultation the public consultation that's currently been long, now now out live uh and, and that's been you know i don't know what the, the figures are at the moment but we're certainly exceeding uh even in just over a week uh what was done in the six weeks consultation last year and we've surpassed that already so we have a really strong engagement from members of the public as well. So, but those sort of things will give it an, an indication which sort of direction we're, we're looking towards. Okay. If, if that helps. But there's time to... to... Yeah, of course it is. Okay, yeah. thank you. Do you have any further questions yourself? Right. Yes. A few questions if I may, Chair. On page 36, it mentioned under 4.4, uh, Operation Uplift, um, the 20,000 additional officers nationally, is that really an uplift or is it a restoration of what we had way back in 2010? You know, because I think we've lost about 20,000 officers. The reports I've seen elsewhere are accurate. We lost 20,000 officers, not in North Wales, of course, but nationally. And obviously the government have tried to uh, uh, supplement those now to ensure that we get back to where we were. Uh, so uh, that's the first question. And on page 37... Uh, mention is made there of uh, additional uh, money coming in, and it mentions PCSOs. Does that money still come from Welsh Government as opposed to the Home Office? Uh, just have a clarification on that, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, I can't answer nationally about the 20,000 officers, but the 206 officers that North Wales Police is gaining from Operation Uplift would take us above the level that we had previously in 2010. And re PCSOs, um, that does come from Welsh Government. Going back to Operation Uplift, we actually exceeded our um, numbers, was it May this year? Yeah, M May this year, we got back to our 2010 levels. Reference to that again, you know, I think uh, in, in the past when we've had the, the additional police officers uh, uh, allocated to us or we've been able to support them, not all of those will actually appear on the street, as it were. I mean, the public perhaps are uh, quite pleased to see that, but uh, you know, in many cases, the officers will be employed behind the scenes, as it were. You know, cybercrime was mentioned in your report, and again, we made reference to this, didn't we, last week, in terms of our concerns about that. Now that they they'll be working in back rooms, as it were, in dealing with those particular issues, not on the street, as it were. So there's not going to be a higher profile, probably, on our streets in terms of seeing police officers out and about. But nevertheless, they're fighting crime and the new crimes that we are having to deal with in this generation. Yeah, uh, dear Councillor Bethel, and you know, uh, neighbourhood policing is at the at the heart of my policing crime plan, and I, and I know you'll be aware of it, and I know. Uh, new members will be aware of that uh, as well. Uh, and certainly the Chief Constable is aware of that. And that formed part of what we went through regarding the recruitment process as well. Because uh, that visibility and how things look and all the things that we were told as elected members translated and, and formed part of that rec that uh, recruitment process in, the, in appointing the new Chief Constable as well. And, and on that, I think be quite interested to bring a man in as well just to touch on it and and give her experience of what how how strong that case was put forward through that process as well i think it'd be quite useful to just to provide the mem members with that that information 
Thank you, Diok. Thank you. Um, so the visibility um, factor is is really important to communities. And, you know, certainly since I've um, started, I, I've had meetings with members of the community, with the commissioner, and we've spoken directly about that and our planning around it in order to make sure that we are in a position where the public are able to see us, access us, have that conversation with us. We're also very much aware of the fact that, you know, the way people live their lives is very different as well some people live that online so we've got to be visible in lots of different ways and we know that there is offending that happens behind the scenes as well you know in in, in more of a cyber environment um we also from our uplift um you know the, the numbers for uplift you know part of that has been a contribution that's been nationally agreed with the home office to our regional organized crime units so you know some of that additionality has already been filtered out into areas that are very important to us in terms of eradicating county lines, dealing with uh, modern day slavery, um, de dealing with the exploitation that we see in all those areas. The PCSO um, position in terms of Wales is a good position to be in because you're absolutely right. We are funded in relation to PCSOs to a certain number by Welsh Government, but that grant comes with conditions and that is match funding. Um, so it has to be that we have an equal amount that are employed locally by us to match the funding that is given by Welsh Government. And in fact, I meet with Welsh Government to go through that and to understand the plans to get us to that amount, because if we don't reach that, we're capped in relation to that grant. And obviously the PCSO visibility is really important in our communities from the point of view of having and being the eyes and the ears of the community, but gathering the intelligence and working closely with us in, you know, in terms of the crime fighting part of the business to make sure that we've got that prevention agenda very firmly set. So, you know, I've already started in terms of the um, you know, the, the Chief Constable's delivery plan that very much is aligned to the police and crime plan to make sure that we are tackling the heart of our business, which is the unique role of policing in our communities, being visible, doing the prevention work and making sure that we're tackling the things that the public shouldn't have to put up with. Um, you know, that's very much at the heart of, you know, what I'm trying to deliver here uh, in North Wales. Thank you. Just to come back on that as well, Councillor Bithell, uh... We don't want our rural communities feeling as though they're left out on their own either. And it was all, who was meant to be seen? We've seen the uh, NFU and uh, FUW quite recently, only down the road in Conway Business uh, Centre there. Uh, you know, we can understand and we recognise the importance of, of visibility, not just in our more urbanised areas, but our rural communities as well play a significant part of that as well. And I just wouldn't want any any members here or, or members of the public feeling so that they're, they're forgotten about. Certainly not. Uh, everybody is in the, the heart of our plan and, and what we can do to provide the best possible police service for North Wales. Could I um, please ask you on about rural areas getting left out. In South Mariana, especially in Tawin Abadawi area, we do feel left out. We see a police officer maybe once a month, if you're lucky. And this is this has been going on now for a couple of years. The people of Tawin would love to see the police back on the beat. We have one police officer, I believe, who goes on, a, when, he, when he signs on, he has to go 20 odd miles to Dolgathley and then come back to Tawin. We very rarely see the police presence in town, Abu Dhabi, Brinkley, Clanagrin. And we would love to have some more officers there on a more regular basis. Thank you. Yeah, Dioch, uh, I think that's, I think it really just encapsulates what I've just said there about how important it is for our rural communities. Not, I, I don't want them feeling like that, feeling left that, like that. But so I'm glad that you've raised it here. But there's also, we, we've introduced this year alone. We've introduced the engagement van, rural crime team, uh, and now we're just starting that process of where they're wanting their own engagement vehicle as well to to address those issues that that you've brought to mind. And we well, know me, myself and the and the chief constable have had those conversations. We there's other things that we're looking into uh, as well, and and like the use of technology and how that can be used to its optimum in supporting our rural communities as well. And that's not to dismiss what like your traditional Bobby on the beat, so to speak. 
but this will be about being more creative, a bit more innovative, uh, and using the resources that we've got to the best possible best possible solutions. And it might not be that we'd have a be able to have a police station in every town and in every village across North Wales. And, and as much as it would be lovely to have, there's the practical implication of that would be very very low, and it wouldn't be. I don't think it'd be fair to to set that sort of level of expectation to to the to the people of North Wales, but it doesn't mean to say that we can't have conversations with with other community groups and, and maybe have it. We know that, that we have panned with the with the with the pigs uh, with the panned with the with the uh, pig CSO. Uh, there's other things similar to that about having those sort of engagement events, uh, and I'd rather be working with you to try and address these sort of problems. And and and, and you'll know better than me on what. What would work in your area, and perhaps we can pick that up after after the meeting here today. What we do see a lot of is boy girl races around the town, various times of the night, and the possibility of um, there is a big drug problem, and cars are meeting together in certain places at night. The locals know where they are. I've reported it myself many times. I don't know if there's any convictions or anything happened from there. But it is a big problem in rural areas. Okay, th thank you for that. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, you guys are sorry. I'm looking. So it's just it's just to fully acknowledge what you're saying, to be very clear that one of the key pieces of work that I've got starting in the next week or so is to review exactly what we've got where across North Wales to make sure that we've got the right resources in the right places and that we're not having a position where officers are having to spend their duty time travelling backwards and forwards to collect kit and to collect, collect equipment and that we're also being responsive to our communities. If you're reporting something and you're not getting a response in relation to that, then the very least I would expect is an explanation um, so that you know exactly what the situation is because that needs to be tackled so I'll take that away to personally look at it but at the same time just to give you the reassurance that we are reviewing exactly what we've got where and that we make sure that we are able to operate to today's problems um, and do that with fleet of foot really. Thank you for that. Do we have any further specific questions on the budget please? Uh, can I have a proposer? Uh, and second there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and can I ask members to show their hands to note the report? Thank you very much. Moving on to item 9A, summary of complaints received against the Police and Crime Commissioner, September 2021, September 2022. And it's Dawn who's taking this out. Thank you, Dawn. Um, so the summary of complaints received between September last year and this year is on pages 43 to 46 of your agenda pack. I don't intend to go this through the report in detail. The report is there for information, as there is an obligation for us to produce a report annually detailing the complaints received. And as you can see from the report, there are no recordable complaints that have been received during the last 12 months against the commissioner or the deputy commissioner. So it's there for information. Can I ask for a proposal, please? Thank you. And a second there. Thank you. Thank you. And members to show the hands to note the report, please. Thank you very much. Item 11C is to consider the forward work programme for the North Wales Police and Crime Panel. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yes. Item 9B, uh, the mid year monitoring report from 1st of April to the 30th of September. Thank you, Chair. I'll take that. So that's on pages 47 to 56 for you. So the mid-year claim is low due to uh, we didn't have any meetings until September. That was due to the local elections and the need to appoint a new panel. So members' expenses on page 56 are shown as zero, and it was too late to claim them in the last claim. So they will be claimed in the second period, which will be at the end of March. The report also advises of the number of meetings held and number of documents the panel has uh, produced. Again, the report is for information. Um, that's, it. that's it, Chair. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Councillor Bittle? Could I just ask a question? I think it's in relation to 3.7. Um, the, the formal PCP meetings have to be held in person. You know, with local authorities now, you know, we come to the realization uh, post COVID that uh, we can hold meetings quite capably and uh, quite efficiently by uh, 
um, Zoom and by uh, Microsoft Teams and so on. I'm wondering whether it's uh, an opportune time perhaps to approach the Home Office to change the regulations in relation to this and to catch up with the, the 21st century and actually uh, allow the, uh, these meetings to actually take place by Zoom. I mean, Welsh Government have accepted this sometimes part of the legislation in Welsh Government now to allow local authorities to actually have hybrid, hybrid meetings or, or Zoom meetings and so on. Is it an opportune time for us to raise this? And again, it would save us great deal of money, wouldn't it, as a police, uh, uh, as a police uh, crime commission panel in terms of travel, uh, time, energy, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and save the some of the pollution as well, which transpires from that. I'm just wondering whether it's worthwhile pursuing. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, we got a meeting in the Welsh? Yeah, I don't think it would be the Home Office that you, we would uh, speak to, I think, because we're governed by who, uh, local authorities in England. It's, we're governed by their legislation, not Home Office legislation. So I'd have to find out, we, I mean, we, you know, they have made representation previously, um, but it was uh, not taken on board. So um, I can find out whether there's any other um, way we can make such representation for you. Yeah. We've got a meeting next week, isn't it? Or with the, with the LGM? Oh, yeah, yes. We could take it, we could look at that as well, take it up, see if anybody else is interested in pushing it forward as well. Any other questions? Coming back on that, <clears throat> okay, we had the pre meeting on Zoom or whatever, fair enough, but I think that a, a main meeting should be face to face uh in all councils to be honest but we have another panel at the moment and um uh, I, I don't think we should go on zoom only okay Thank you, Chair. So the forward plan is there. So the next meeting, as been said, is on the 30th of January, where you will consider the precept um, and the uh, uh, Police and Crime Commissioner and Chief Constable's medium term financial plan. Um, and like you say, if you've got any topics that you think you want putting on the agenda, if you contact me and we can advise you accordingly. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not much of a forward plan, is it? <laughs> So, it, so we can come up with the suggestions that we wish to sort of do our deep dive into, if you like, and, and, and bring you with enough notice. So it'd be good to have an agenda for the whole of next year, really, wouldn't it? Would have thought. Given what Council Pew and, and my interest, I think Roads Policing Unit would be um, quite a suitable one to give us a presentation. I know we have a celebrity here, a former celebrity from the glass. To add to that the um 20 mile an hour limit that's coming in could we talk about that i really feel the police are going to get it in the neck from law-abiding citizens like myself um can we talk can we bring that into the legislation's coming in when when is the big change and you guys are going to be managing it yeah so it's, it's that, that's next year isn't it but uh, we can well, we just put it forward can't we I, I think if you've got some ideas just talk it whatever you want to do how are we going to manage that the other one, talking about hate crime, is the diversity unit. And I know the Federation are interested but in coming to talk to us, but certainly roads policing unit and diversity for me. Before the meeting started, we say that if it's the high tech crime unit, yeah. it would be beneficial for us. I'll, I'll discuss with Stephen when it's appropriate time to bring these forward.
Go back, Lauren. Recording stopped.